Welcome everybody. Bienvenue, Anine. We're so pleased to have you back for another year of the Toronto District School Board and Ontario Institute uh, Studies and Education uh, webinar series. We've been at this for a while now, since the start of the pandemic. And um, we're really thrilled to have all of you here in the room with us and for those who are watching uh, via recording as well. I'm just gonna share screen to get us underway. We're really happy to uh, tell you about our new focus on climate change education. Uh, the TDSB has got a climate action plan and education and professional learning for teachers is a really key component of that. So um, by the way, my name is Hilary Inwood and I am the coordinator of the Sustainability and Climate Action Network at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, commonly known as OISE. Uh, it's part of the University of Toronto. I'm really thrilled to welcome uh, colleagues I work so closely with at the TDSB. Uh, Pam Miller, who's the instructional leader for the TDSB's uh, Eco Schools program and the Sustainability Office. Jen Vetter and Chris Metropolis, uh, mighty members of the Eco Schools team. Um, and I'd like you to introduce you to Sarah and to Felicia, who are also members of our uh, SCAN team at OISE. We're really lucky to uh, to have them this year, helping to uh, to keep me in line. Frankly, is what they're what their main job is and <laughs> help to facilitate all of the learning that we do with the TDSB and beyond. So um, we're going to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Lindsay Kirkland, in just one second. Uh, please do uh, start the poll if you're in the room with us, um, fill out the poll so we know a little bit about your role and your affiliation um, to begin. We are going to begin with a land acknowledgement, as we always do, and then Pam will introduce uh, Lindsay, who is our keynote speaker. Uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you'll know that we often do art-based uh, land acknowledgements as a way to introduce you to the work of Indigenous artists. It's a, an area that's near and dear to my heart as a visual arts educator. And so I'd like to introduce you to the work of Dr. Duke Redbird. Uh, Dr. Duke Redbird is uh, one of the elders who works with the Urban Indigenous Education Center uh, at the Toronto District School Board. And we are specifically introducing his work today um, because he is the keynote for our conference in October. And so we thought this was a, a great little teaser. Um, this particular work um, is called Wigwam uh, Chichimang. And I will say that uh, Dr. Duke Redberg is an elder from the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation on the shores of Lake Huron. He's a celebrated Indigenous visionary, uh, as well as an established public intellectual, a uh, poet, a broadcaster, a filmmaker, and an artist. He is going to be the keynote uh, at our conference. We'll tell you a little bit more about that and where to register uh, later in this session. And know that the conference is open and free to all TDSB educators and staff and all members of the OISE community as well. This particular work, Wigwam Chichimong, uh, known as Big House Canoe, uh, was a floating art installation and Indigenous interpretive learning center that was created by Dr. Redbird, with paintings by uh, Philip Cote, who's an amazing Indigenous painter and traditional wisdom keeper from Moose Deer Point First Nation. Uh, it was docked at the Marina at Ontario Place for a number of years, actually, and it helped to tell the story of Indigenous presence on Toronto's waterfront. Um, Dr. Redbird was involved in one of the installations in Nuit Blanche that happened this last weekend uh, here in Toronto. So. Um, he, he gets around and we're really thrilled that he's coming around to our conference to give the keynote to, on October 28th. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Pam to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for today. Absolutely. And I'm just looking at the chat and thank you for those that are putting in a little bit about you. I, I think is as well as inviting Lindsay into the room and bringing her expertise I love what Margaret J. Wheatley says, that we are wise together, and you all bring so much wisdom and passion to this work that I'm just so thrilled to be here with you uh, this September. But I actually had a pleasure meeting Lindsay via Zoom uh, this summer in a summer institute because she is the Senior Climate Education Manager at uh, uh, yeah, Climate Generation. And actually, I, I've been up to another workshop with you in, Lindsay, but I tried to hide. so. Yeah, I just, you know, <laughs> um, but Lindsay supports ongoing climate change education programs for K-12 educators and public audiences. As the education manager, she also develops a vision for and provides strategic coordinations for programs focusing primarily on professional development for teachers and informal educators. Lindsay is an adjunct facility, uh, sorry, faculty at Hamline University and supported the development of 
Development of the Climate Literary Certificate. A contributing author of NSTA, that's National Science Teachers Association, I believe, uh, Connect Science a Learning Journal, and an active member of Climate Literacy and the Energy Awareness Network, CLEAN, and the North American Association of Environmental Education. And um, there'll be a test on those acronyms later, so don't you worry. Uh, guidelines, uh, yeah, so you're on the Guidelines for Excellence Writing Team. And in fact, I think NAEE is looking for guidance on their climate literacy um, things coming up as well. Um, where am I? Um, you've also, Lindsay has worked as a naturalist, uh, served as an environment educator with the America Corps program and the New Jersey Watershed Ambassadors. Uh, you've worked as a program coordinator for the New Jersey Audubon Society and assisted in program development for museums, universities, and a new nonprofit organizations in the United States and Australia. Lindsay holds a, a Bachelor of Science, I didn't want to say BS, um, in environment. <laughs> That's not an acronym we want. Uh, conservation and fishery science from the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and an MED in science education from Reuters University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And in your spare time, and this is the exciting piece, uh, Lindsay enjoys spending time with her husband and her son and is expecting number two as we speak. So we're pretty excited. We don't have the hot water boiling because it's not that quick, um, but welcome Lindsay, warm welcome from uh, we Canadians uh, who love your work and the equity and diversity focus that Climate Generation has had for the past couple of years. Thanks, Pam. Thanks for that introduction and celebrating all my acronyms and <laughs> affiliations. I've worked hard for those over the years, so it's great to hear them listed out. Uh, I just have to say, I'm finding this space super joyful. And one of the practices that at Climate Generation we try to embody is creating joy together. And you're already doing that and helping me do that too. So I appreciate you all for that. And I appreciate everyone for joining today. Uh, I did put a blurb in about this um, North American Association for Environmental Education's Guidelines for Excellence. I didn't format it at all, but I just copied it if you wanna see what that's about. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you today about climate change education. And as I get my screen sharing, I'd love for you all to tell me why you're here today. Um, I'll put this chat or this prompt in the chat, but if you give me like a sentence, a couple words, just say like, what are you hoping to get out of today? Why'd you choose to come to this uh, webinar or workshop? And, and what do you need, basically? And I'll get myself oriented here. <laughs> I was thinking someone would say, I get I get uh, continuing education credit, so I'm showing up. <laughs> I love that Cam has referred to it as climate, climate crisis education. Cam, that's brilliant. Great. Uh, we'll keep them coming. And just to reintroduce myself and give a little bit more context, um, Everything that Pam said is accurate. I am the climate change education manager at Climate Generation. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Vermont in the United States, which is Wabanaki and Abenaki lands. Um, and I am probably gonna give birth in like two weeks or three weeks. So this is, that's me right now. Uh, that's encompassing my whole being. So, but I'm glad to spend this time with you. And this was a fun presentation or workshop to put together. So thank you for this opportunity. Climate Generation, which a lot of you probably haven't heard of, is based in Minnesota, in Minneapolis in particular. Um, and our mission in, is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. And broadly, the whole organization works with youth, educators, and community members or uh, public leaders of some kind, community leaders. And my role is to work primarily with educators, informal and formal, and to really figure out what do what do they need to do this work well and what does that look like for them particularly like thinking about this global crisis and translating it into local action that feels good and hopeful and anxiety reducing as a lot of you have mentioned um this is not an easy thing to do uh, i don't think you'd be here if you thought it was easy either so 
you know, there's a lot of reports recently coming out from um, researchers that like study how we're going to solve the climate crisis. It's become really apparent that climate change education is essential for effective and, and equitable approach to solving the crisis. But a lot of K-12 educators or informal educators tell us that they, they don't have enough resources or opportunities to learn about climate change themselves or teach about it. Um, and this can be a real struggle if we're going to try, try to embed education into climate action projects. And, and we know uh, from research and from talking to hundreds of educators that um, folks want to know about climate change. They want those resources and they want to connect with people regularly and ongoing all the time to share their challenges and successes in integrating climate change into their classrooms or other learning contexts. This really mirrors what, what you all have expressed today in the chat, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, unfortunately, I, I really won't be able to answer all of these questions today. I won't be able to send you away with some like plan of action, but what we can do is engage in a critical discussion about what's possible and what you're already doing and learn from each other. So I'm glad to see that you're all eager to talk to each other too, because I'm hoping we might have some time for that. Um, like Pam said, we host this annual Summer Institute for Climate Change Education every year for the past 18 years. And every year we ask educators, why, why do you come to this? What do you want? And they sort of echo what you said. I want to be better informed and I want to have ideas how to be a better teacher. Um, and luckily we have some resources that can help us do that. And today what I hope to do is give you sort of the lay of the land of climate change education. I'll describe some of the founding principles of effective climate change education, which are backed by research and practice. And then hopefully we can talk about some of the teaching practices that might, might support that work. And I'll just disclaimer, there's a lot of different practices. Some you're probably already doing that you might not know about um, and others that you might wanna try out in the future. So this is that part's gonna be kind of like a crowdsourcing of like, what are folks doing? So, in true, my style is trying to be as interactive as possible. So I'm gonna ask you to answer some prompts in the chat quite a bit. Um, and one of the prompts I have for you is I'm wondering how you think climate change education is different than other forms of education. And we'll answer this in the chat. You can take a minute to think about it. Thanks, Georgia, for being the first one to answer that. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay, if it's okay, I'll read out a few of the answers just so for people who see the recording. Oh, yes, that's great. Thanks. All right. So we've had answers from it's political uh, to uh, there's not a student teacher divide. It's still a polarizing issue. It's essential for the survival of humanity. It's big and cross-curricular. Those are some of the responses we've had to your questions so far. Mm -hmm. It's more integrated learning, makes us face reality and looks for solutions. It's all encompassing, yet no clear direction. It's full of misinformation. <laughs> Um, extremely present, high stakes, and also evolving quickly. That's very true. Yeah. Thanks, Hillary, and thanks for the reminder for me to be aware of our folks watching the recording. Okay, there's no textbook for climate change education. Uh, David says it's, it doesn't feel super different. Um, it's part of critical geographic thinking. And it's not one specific subject. It's integrated into a lot of different subjects. Yes, all of these are, in my opinion, true. Um, there could, a lot of times, depending on who you are, this might not feel dramatically different than what you already teach, especially if you're like a civics teacher. Uh, but for other folks, it feels very different because there is no textbook, right? Or um, there is no like hundred years of research that you can rely on and have regular access to and, and it hasn't changed over time, right? That's not true with climate change science, right? We know it changes over time. So um, just kind of, we wanna acknowledge this and welcome this end, like that complexity into this space and live in it because it's real. There's no solving that or fixing it. 
it's important to acknowledge it. Uh, many people in the climate change education world believe that climate change is a wonderful and integrating context um, because it's real world, it impacts people, um, and it can be used in many different subjects like civics, policy, history, math, art. Um, and so folks will say like, what better context to place your subjects and classes in, right? You know, um, it does come with its challenges too. We can't uh, avoid that. So anthropogenic climate change is, in my opinion, a unique issue to teach about because public opinion differs remarkably from country to country, from community to community, and from home to home. And it depends on a whole range of political and cultural factors of the people that exist in those spaces. And from this point alone, and from other forms of data, it's become really clear that approaches in climate change ed education need to vary across those different contexts and scales to be effective. So that makes it really hard. And one of the greatest differences, in my opinion, between teaching about climate change and other, let's say, science topics, maybe not all topics, is this call to action that's required. Um, this is a call to action to, for people to change their behaviors to help reduce climate change or to advocate for community-based changes to solve climate change. And this idea of educators needing to be advocates in this space doesn't always sit well with everyone. Teachers that I talk to are like, I wanna teach objective truths. I don't wanna impart moral judgments or my opinions onto my students. And so this grappling of um, the difference or similarities between being an educator and an advocate is really challenging for a lot of people. And it's something that you have to navigate throughout this entire process. The cool thing is, is that we're at a time in the world when there's a lot of great research out there and practical projects that are happening in the education field that can inform how we might approach this type of education and address some of these barriers that we might experience. And there's quite a disparate field of study on what topics should be included and covered when teaching about climate change. It might include research on local education initiatives or um, that address weather, water, and energy monitoring could be community level action or social justice and education action campaigns. There's just a whole host of things. Um, and the issue of what should be taught as well as how it should be taught has been addressed. And depending on what research you choose to read and engage with, some authors might say, focus on systemic change and others might say, focus on small scale actions that are at the level of your classroom um, or schoolyard or local environment. Um, so it's really hard for people to figure out what is the best approach for me? And how do I even start or where do I start? And how do I know I'm doing a good job? Um, so today I've tried to simplify some of this into digestible points that we can make a story from at least and maybe start from. So if you were to ask me like, Lindsay, what should I teach about regarding climate change? I would say, focus on personally relevant and meaningful information that's related to climate change in your subject or sits at the intersection of that, your subject area. And if you were to ask me, how should I teach it? I would probably say, use active and engaging teaching methods, interact with people doing the work, address misconceptions as they come up and implement school and community projects that seem relevant and important to your students. That seems super easy, <laughs> but five, five points, right? Um, and if it was that easy, of course, you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be talking to you. And we know it's not that easy. <clears throat> so although I've described the what here in one sentence, to me, the behind the scenes of choosing what to teach regarding climate change is really complex because it often spans the personal, the community-based, cultural and education spheres of students' lives. So what I'm hoping to do today is sort of dig into that using a research-based framework um, so some of our time, I'm just going to walk through that, maybe the next 15 minutes. And then what I'm hoping to do is dig into the how with you. Um, we'll put, after I talk for about 15 minutes, we'll put you into small groups so you can process what I said. Um, and then we'll do a large group discussion. So hopefully everyone's feeling okay with that. I'm not really watching the chat, so please call attention to that if there are any questions coming up. Great. I'm gonna get a drink of water. Lindsay, while you're taking a drink, yeah. there was a comment in the chat really about we 
we think we can teach objectively, but in fact, you know, when you look at Parker Palmer's work, The Courage to Teach, and Maria has brought that up, that neutrality is actually part of the problem. And when we distance our heart and our head and our hands in separate ways and don't embrace the wholeness, uh, which we know from Indigenous pedagogy, then we actually are doing our kids a disservice. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I was trained as a scientist, so I thought that objective truth existed for a long time. And it took me a long time to realize that everything's subjective. <laughs> Thanks for calling attention to that, Pam. Okie dokie. Um, here's the framework we're going to use, and I'm going to describe it. So first of all, some context. There aren't that many in my experience, research-based resources that create broad frameworks for climate change education that really reflect how professionals are practicing it. However, this one does a very good job. This is a model that was proposed in 2017 by a group of researchers from Finland. Um, they use it, they created it based on uh, a lot of different research that they brought together and summarized. And they encourage people to use it as a way to think about creating educational interventions that last over long periods of time. So this is not a model that um, would be used to create a lesson plan. It might be a model that could be used to establish a learning progression over the course of a year or multiple years or establish curriculum guidelines or education programs as a whole. And the reason is, is because this is a holistic climate change education model. It incorporates a lot of different ways of understanding climate science, but then also integrating the personal positionalities and, identi and identities that we hold. So they've used this bicycle graphic as a way to create a metaphor for these different themes. And as you can see, the, some of the themes probably are really familiar to you, like knowledge and thinking, action, or motivation, right? Um, but some of them are pretty unique to climate change education, like future orientation, identity and worldview and operational barriers. Hope and emotions is probably pretty unique to climate change education as well. And I found through my graduate teaching and other times I've used this and shared with this, share this with educator communities, they find it really helpful to have just this visual framework and guideline to, to establish like, what are all the things I should be thinking about when I'm thinking about teaching climate change? So let's dig into the first one, which is often easiest for educators to sort of know about, um, which is knowledge. And of course I have this big X, but I'll explain what that is. Um, so a lot of times people believe that educators can create change through knowledge building, right? That's kind of like the presumption of what education is doing. And the most common explanation um, is that knowledge creates action and can move people towards behavior change. Um, and this is called the knowledge action theory. However, research shows um, in climate change education, knowledge is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for people to take action towards climate change solutions. So for example, we might know that driving our car contributes to greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, which contributes to climate change but we might still not choose to ride our bike or walk. And um, this is an indicator that taking action is partially an outcome of knowledge. Like we need to know what our impacts do from a scientific perspective or from this really like logical contribution to the greenhouse gas effect. But it also depends on our attitudes and beliefs and other variables. Um, and it's often the combination of these things that affect what students learn or take away from the classrooms and how they use it in their everyday life. So um, although we want to situate climate change education in like building knowledge of the phenomena, we also have to consider all of these other variables, which I'm going to walk through a little bit. So finding out what motivates students to engage in classrooms or other learning activities is a challenge course. <laughs> Not easy. Uh, one thing that's clear in climate change education research is that climate change should not be described as a distant issue. It's something that's 
or something that's like too complicated for any one person to understand, right? Um, we don't ever want to portray it as like, it's going to be such a hard thing to overcome. It is, but that paints the picture of like, it's insurmountable and impossible to overcome. Rather, we should be emphasizing that climate change, it's happening now, it's affecting people now, and people have the power to respond. And climate generation likes to use these five points. Um, we can call them learning outcomes or messages, right? Um, but we like to get these things across in like every presentation or lesson or activity that we do. And um, one powerful strategy that educators can use for this affecting motivation and participation is through personal storytelling or um, using narratives from their community or real life examples of climate change action happening and taking place in their regions by people. I like to call this like highlighting the people power behind the work. You know, there is no climate change solution without the people that created it. And when you can um, portray those people power stories to students, they can really build, get a lot of hope from that. Participation in my mind is really closely connected to motivation and our next topic, which is action. Um, to me, participation is a product of being motivated to act and having access to local projects or initiatives for taking action towards climate change solutions. So like we talked about earlier, and I think someone probably mentioned in the chat, is the role of education and climate change um, ought to play a deep role in assisting youth to develop understanding of public issues and then their capacity for um, meaningful engagement in these conversations at a community level. Um, that community can be at different scales and levels, right? Um, so here we see different forms of actions that students can take. And I'm sure you have examples of these things yourself. It could be creating a poster for a climate change education event. It could be giving a presentation on something they care about related to climate change. Could be dressing up as a bee and bringing a flower to a parade. <laughs> And it could be advocating to your local politician, right? And telling your climate story there. So all of these um, avenues towards action can be highlighted by educators and that, that can therefore increase motivation and participation of students, as long as these actionable things are within their community and are attainable by them. Oftentimes we like might structure an action project around something they would never be able to do by themselves, right? Or like, um, doesn't have any effect in their broader community outside, but it's within their home. And, and when we can kind of think about how do we make something that's attainable and connect it to broader community, we're really talking about like integrating and building relationships between our students and the broader impacts in their community. From a lot of the research, and it's hard to actually find a lot of this actually, research and like understandings on identity values and worldviews as it intersects with climate change education because it comes from a very different field of research, but I think there's some out there. Um, so this model actually situates identity values and worldviews as like the frame of the bicycle because they believe it's the foundation of effective climate change education. And the idea behind this is that climate change itself, to solve it, raises issues and questions and discussions related to humanity, society, culture, ethics, all of these things that are deeply ingrained in who we are as a person and as a community, and asks us to call into question our values and how we're acting out our values. Um, and the, this can be really hard to bring up in the classroom if you don't have a practice for that. And the challenge of teaching climate change is that oftentimes people in these spaces have conflicting values. And how do you manage these conflicts of values and identity? And maybe it's not always conflicting, but you just hold a lot of that variability in the same space to move a group of people towards a similar solution. And that this can be really challenging, although, when it's approached in specific ways, it can be really valuable. So um, some of the practices I know that educators can weave in discussions on values through their lessons or values-based work, um, asking students, what are your values? Um, where do they come from? How did you develop them? How do you wanna live into them? And, and these different forms of activities that you choose to do 
can be grounded in practices that help students understand and define and live into those, but then also help them understand and respect other people in the classroom and then find commonalities among them, find commonalities among broader groups, like in their community, um, or uh, even evaluate projects and ask them to say, what values do they, do you think they upheld with this project? So it just takes a little bit of digging um, and can be really rewarding for everyone in the space when, when it's done in tandem uh, with an exploration of a climate change project. Lindsay, maybe if I could interrupt, I was looking at a comment in the chat as well. Great. And I, I think those of us who are familiar with Goldie Muhammad's work, uh, really mm -hmm. how it's a historical equity framework where identity is at the, the front of all teaching and building a strong identity uh, with our students and celebrate uh, what they do bring from an asset based lens, mm -hmm. I think also addresses Anne's comment. Um, you know, even when Bill Gibbons says, you know, humans are causing it, we we know, and and I really appreciate that she's unpacked it here, because not all humans are the cause. And we know that there are seven companies that have caused most of it. And it's a lot easier for BP to ask us to do our carbon footprint uh, and put them off the, and take them off the line. Um, mm -hmm. But Perhaps this is a good entry point when we're talking about identity in the classroom that a lot of the kids in front of us have are are, are of communities that have uh, contributed the least mm -hmm. to climate change. And I think of a group, you know, worried about their their um, transportation to school footprint that they, you know, they couldn't track that they were saving from cars, but I was able to celebrate with them that they were all walking. And that's a good thing. <laughs> and so uh, perhaps we could bring those two, or or maybe to you, how do you bring those two things to get together? Celebrating mm -hmm. identities of people who are on the outside and not, not uh, responsible for this crisis and, and yet knowing it is us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hear that. I'm gonna hold on to it and not respond right away besides to say, um, I hear you and I understand that challenge and I'm interested in talking about it <laughs> and we'll come back to it. Thanks for calling my attention to it. Um, okay, I just have a couple more to go and then we're gonna pause for, yeah, talking. Um, let's go to the next one. So hope um, here is an important, component that helps people engage in solving problems, um, particularly the climate crisis. And I think I believe hope is a product of being connected to local climate change action um, that is also connected to our values, right? So you can't, a lot of research shows that you can't really have hope or ignite hope if there is no form of um, making change towards problems that you can visualize and experience in your world. Um, and so many youth, which you probably are aware of in research and in our classrooms say that they're feeling grief and anxiety because they have very little hope for their future. <clears throat> and so effective climate change education should ideally nurture hope by validating those feelings, saying it's okay to have these negative feelings. It's totally natural to respond with grief at the like anticipation that you might lose your day-to-day structure of your life, or you might lose things that you hold dear to you or sacred spaces, right? that's okay. It's okay to be anxious about that. Um, but what we can do is after we validate those is move towards building avenues for action and, and that are situated in those values and the things that they wanna preserve and conserve. There's a lot of research that shows that youth who believe that society has the ability to change and that they can play a role in that actually are more likely to be hopeful. And when educators can help find those pathways for them, it can relieve the symptoms of anxiety and grief. And one um, way we can do that is living into this pretty unique theme of climate change education, which is future orientation. So this idea that you provide space and time for students and yourself to envision what a better future looks like. What is the vision that you want to create? Who's there? Who isn't there? What are the decisions we have to make to get there? 
Um, and this is where the art piece can come in here. I mean, not that it can't come in anywhere, but this is a great one. Um, building a utopian dream world or looking at projects and saying, what parts of that project do you like? What are the parts you don't like? What do you want to change, right? Um, where do you want to highlight responsibility for making change? Those types of things. And in my experience, educators tend to forget this. But once they are like focused on it, it becomes very easy to integrate into what they're already doing. Um, it could just be reflective exercises. It, be, it could be create a diorama, draw a picture, have a discussion. Um, can be very easy to integrate to what you're already doing. So I know that was a lot of information back to back. I hope a lot of it wasn't brand new to you. Obviously, you all seem like a very... Um, knowledgeable group of educators already practicing these things and critically questioning these things. So I really appreciate that. But I do want to give folks some time to like digest and talk about some either things that have come up in the chat or things that I've shared. So I would love to put us into breakout rooms um, of groups of three for just a few minutes, five minutes, seven minutes. Um, and you can talk about really whatever you want, but I, if you introduce yourself to one another, and then these are some prompts you could pursue. Are you practicing some of this now and how, what's something new you want to try out or what something you want to push back on? If there's a topic you want to push back on. The only thing I ask um, is that you give space for the people, each person in the room to talk to each other, to share what they're thinking. And since it's such a, a short time, um, maybe give space for each person to share before you try to respond to the other person. Thanks for engaging in that short, short breakout room. We always hope we can have more time. Right. Um, yeah, I appreciate you. And I had a chance to go back and look through some of the comments and in the chat and I dropped some resources in there that I had time to respond to. Um, so for the next, I know the group here needs about five minutes to wrap up some things at the end. So let's um, quickly do a little bit of a larger group reflection too. Um, why don't we pop in the chat? What are some of the things you're sitting with after listening to me and talking with the people in your group? Um, what's resonating with you and what do you feel like you need more time to explore? Maybe, Maybe I can start it off. I'm, okay. I'm just going to say that it, 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 something that helped in our discussion in our group helped me sort of connect is that we all feel things, we all have interests or passions in our lives um, that we are already engaged in. So finding mm -hmm. ways to connect climate change education is not that hard once we start digging a little bit more below the surface. And I think it's easier to do the work when we're already connecting it to things we feel passionate about. And whether that's you know, working with our own children. Um, for me, it's educational gardening. Um, mm -hmm. There's there are connections. Something Sun Sunday had put into the chat earlier uh, in today's session about uh, carbon sequestration in soil, and so I, I think there's ways that we can find to do this work that that really uh, let us bring our full selves and our 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 passions and our emotions to the work, right? Which is important, mm -hmm. and I think that's true of our students too. Yeah. And Hillary, that speaks to um, one of the first questions from Judy is like, where can we start? Which should we include? Where should you start? I mean, the easiest thing is to start with the lowest hanging fruit, <laughs> in my opinion. What What are you already doing that's working? Um, how can you build off of that? What are some relatively simple practices you can incorporate? Um, I have some resources to share with you, which we won't talk about, but like, how do we transform these theories into practice? There's a lot of stuff out there for you um, that might help you figure out some of those easy entry points. Um, what should we include? And then like, how do you, I think another question is, how do you tailor this to different grades, like K2, which is particularly challenging. There's a whole field of research about what climate change education looks like in kindergarten through second grade it's vastly different than middle school and high school. So I, if you ever want resources, please, you can email me. And um, we have people that are trying to work on that, like getting a landscape view of what that is. Um, yeah, what are some other things that are coming in the chat? We need curriculum change in teacher education. Yes, I applaud you all for seeking out your own avenues to get this information for yourself. There is definitely not enough systemic support for this work. Lindsay, we have 
uh, some early, uh, some folks that are teaching the younger students. And I see as well, there's a question about younger students. And I got stuck on David Sobel's, you know, no doom and gloom before grade four, but yet some of our students racially are experiencing doom and gloom in their lives mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So that doesn't work because yeah. that means that uh, we're erasing their identities. So do you want to address, uh, or, or I don't know. How, how would we, I address that? <laughs> yeah, how do we balance that? Yeah. Um, I am a believer of allowing students or people to bring in their emotions and feelings at any time that they want to. And it is my belief that my role as a human is to hold that with them or to provide space for them to bring that. And that's really different for everyone. Um, uh, Catherine Hickman, who is was a keynote at the Summer Institute, she's a psych practicing psychologist and researcher on climate anxiety and grief. And she always talks about the climate change emotion mosaic, which is the pro positive feelings and all the negative feelings and everything in between as being important and valuable and valid responses to what we're experiencing. And she gives real methods on how to validate them and then how to help people see the value in having those feelings in a shared space and moving through them together. And, and that I guess would be my approach. I'm never gonna say you can't talk about the loss of the ice that helps you ice fish in the winter and how sad you are of that or the loss of your grandmother because she died to heat exposure in the summer, right? Those are two very valid and important things to observe and to understand and process through a climate change conversation. Although the level of intensity with those is different. And that would be my approach, at least starting out. Um, I don't think it's, yeah, yeah, appropriate to, to prevent people from bringing in what their real experiences are. Anne, did you wanna say something? Oh, we only have a few more minutes left. Oh, but... sorry. Okay, maybe I'll, um... I, I'm curious about the place of anger. I, I put that in the chat because I feel like that is not spoken of enough and I worry that anxiety somehow, I mean, we all have anxiety, but it's disempowering, but anger can be empowering. And I just wanted to put that in the picture. Thanks, thanks for all your work. Yeah, thanks, Anne. I agree with that. I, I did try to respond to something. I think I would look at Katherine Hickman's work too, because she takes this view of like the emotional mosaic, like all of the feelings are important. There are some, I don't know if you, if this is, I mean, you, you all seem like you have a lot of practices already um, for doing this work. So I don't know if this is too basic for you, but sometimes when we talk about emotions and feelings and people have a very hard time like describing what they are and pinpointing them exactly and where they coming they come from and so there are tools like the emotions wheels or mood meters there's i think this that link should go to one that help people identify their feelings and emotions and then we can use our teacher training to try to figure out how to best address those and validate them in real time and then weave in ways of allowing students to move through those feelings over the course of a long term. So I think anger is definitely one of those. If we have one minute left, is there anything else? Sorry, Hillary. So you, I love that you've made space for people to suggest uh, resources. Uh, it does show the sophistication level of this audience today that they've been suggesting such amazing resources. And uh, Sarah popped a, a book into the chat. Um, oh, and where is it? The Educational Fabulations, Teaching and Learning for a World Yet to Come. I'm not familiar with that one, Sarah, and I can't wait to take a look at that. Uh, it's got a great title, if nothing else. It's so a, It's a great book. It's got, um, they're all fictional chapters, and they come with, they're all educators who've written them. And they're designed to be used in the classroom at middle, I haven't used them in primary, middle and secondary school. Um, and then they come with classroom prompts for discussion and then also additional readings. Mm -hmm. 
you. Um, there's just so many. We will capture all of the resources that you shared uh, as part of um, uh, today's session, and we'll send them out in about uh, a week to everybody. That's if great. Wait for them. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I've learned. I guess I've only been at climate generation for four years, but one of the things I've learned is that this solution can't be solved by any one person or any one model or any one research field. And you all alluded to this at the very, very beginning. So creating spaces that you can help people bring in their expertise and their shared understandings, and then facilitating a space that allows people to move through that complexity together to create better and broader meaning is so effective. Um, it's a strategy that we use for professional development at Climate Generation, and I oftentimes have suggested, like, that's how your classroom should be. <laughs> so I'm happy that you've all shown up for that and have brought yourselves to this session today. Yeah. Is there anything else? I mean, I'm happy to pass it on. Um, and I'm, I guess I'll just say, if you ever want to email me and have a deep discussion, I'm open to that. If you want to ask me for resources about anything, um, definitely message me. And I have at the bottom of this slide deck, which you all have access to, and we can share out, I've um, listed three, what I think are really reliable, great resources that help you think about transforming your own practice as a teacher. It's not just like, do this activity. It's like, what are things you can engage in to understand your values and how they show up in your classroom? Or how do you what is a framework for making a climate action learning process? Um, those types of things. So they're at the bottom of my slide deck, as well as all the research-based articles that I've shared too. And Lindsay, we actually had a couple of questions in our group about um, the, that bicycle model. So I think people will be very interested in taking a look at your slides and we really appreciate your generosity and sharing uh, that with us. Thank you. Um, we're just about at the end of our time together today. So I would like to extend and ask everybody to join me in thanking Lindsay for sharing her approach with us, um, especially as she is uh, off to bring another new climate activist into the world very shortly. And we wish you all the best for that, Lindsay. But thank you. Thanks for sharing your expertise. And thank you to our audience in the room um, for sharing their expertise too. There's so many great resources uh, in the chat today. Uh, we will capture all of those and we will make sure that we share them uh, with links as best we can uh, in about a week with you along with the recording to this. I do want to point out that this is just the start. Um, the TDSB and OISE have just uh, reached their, their new agreement to move forward for another three years together. Um, for, as many of you know, this is a very unique partnership model, um, a, a really great collaboration between OISE and uh, the TDSB um, and all funded by the TDSB and their incredible work um, to ensure that they have funding for professional learning for teachers. So I thank my colleagues at the TDSB um, for uh, really their incredible work in this area. And I'll let you know that uh, there will be lots more events coming up. Um, we've got a bunch of people in from Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board with us today. We welcome people from other school boards to join us. And in fact, we'll be extending invitations uh, to make that a little more formalized uh, as we move forward uh, this next year. So I'm just going to share a screen one last time just to give you a little sense of what's coming down the pipe that we might be able to take advantage of. Um, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is, of course, this Friday, and it's a wonderful opportunity to look for those intersections between climate change education and Indigenous ways of knowing. We, we know that we have so much to learn from Indigenous peoples when it comes to this work. Um, they have been living sustainably on this planet for thousands of years, uh, far longer than many of us from settler uh, communities. And so uh, it's important that we uh, look for ways to really center their voices in, in the work of climate change education. Uh, at OISE, for those of you who might have an interest, we're having a seed saving workshop on October 3rd. We're not advertising that broadly because we can't fit a couple hundred people from the TDSB, but for those who are in the room, you're welcome to join us. Uh, Take Me Outside Day is happening on October 18th. You don't really need an excuse to wait till October 18th. The weather in at least in, uh, in Ontario has been fabulous in this last few weeks. So get your kids outside now. And then finally, we have our um, annual conference between the TDSB and OISE taking place on Saturday, October 28th. It's called Accelerating Climate Change 
education. Uh, Dr. Duke Redberg is the keynote, and we've got a, a whole collection of workshops. Um, now, you uh, are welcome to join us online for that, but we really are trying to move back to an in-person conference because we know that the relationships that are built at this conference are incredibly important uh, for uh, continuing our learning and for sustaining our energy in this work, which is uh, it's challenging work, no doubt. So please, if you can, come and join us for this conference in person. We love, love seeing you in person. So with that, um, I will uh, ask Sarah maybe just to pop the link to um, Sarah, if that's possible, into the chat for the conference. She may have done that already, actually. Uh, and she did. Look at that. I love the way Sarah reads my mind. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, just to extend a thank you to all of you for your participation today. And again, a special thank you to Lindsay. And Lindsay, we wish you all the best with the uh, arrival of your newest one in a few weeks. Uh, we will be doing more of these come uh, a little bit later in the fall. We'll get through the conference first, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll be having you back hopefully in November uh, for more webinars. Take care, everybody.